Well, good morning and aloha. All right. Sir General Sullivan, thanks very much, sir, for you and AUSA. Um, it's amazing how fast a year goes since you were up there touring the, uh, the, the AOC with, uh, with all my folks. Um, I have a wonderful panel here up on stage, but I would be very remiss if I did not, from out in the audience, um, introduce Major General Lee, who is my counterpart, the ROC Air Defense and Missile Commander, from uh, uh, Republic of Korea. General Lee, sir, thanks very much for taking the time to come out. <laughs> he is a terrific war fighting partner and epitomizes uh, what we talk about when we're discussing integrated air and missile defense. So for the past year, North Korea provocations, FAD deployment, approval, for the second Tippy 2 to go into Kyoga, Misaki, Japan, and we were well underway for the planning and execution of that employment. The Army, in a time of drawdown, has approved 13 additional positions into the 94th AMDC to help C2, Task Force Talon, which is the uh, higher headquarters for the THAAD battery in Guam. And as you heard uh, Admiral Thomas speak a little earlier, the SECDEF approved the two additional uh, DDGs coming out to Japan, the BMD mission. So, couple over the last couple of panels, you hear the discussion about 80% of the natural disasters happen here in the Pacific. Well, why all this BMD? Because 100% of the North Korean missile launches come out of North Korea. Who? Cool. <laughs> but it's not just about getting capability on the ground or on the surface or in the air. The commitments that we've seen by both the ROC Air Defense and Missile Command as well as the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force and Air Defense Command to further improve not only just their Patriot capabilities, but more importantly, to improve the integration, cooperation, and synchronization at their mission command nodes, whether it's at the HTAC and the, the CAMDOC, Combined Air and Missile Defense Operations Center in Korea, or whether it's at the Air Defense Command in Yokota, Japan with uh, General Nakashima, our operators sit side by side with their operators and, no kidding, do the planning, do the execution, go through provocation cycles, go through exercises, and it, it's not just the first time on the field together uh, if something were to come up. And that's why this panel is exceptional because this is not the first time that we've all gotten together. We get together for real world, we get together for exercises. Um, even Pellet and I go dive once in a while, so it, it's, a great, it's a great panel of Folks that, that are at the, right here is the core of PACOM's integrated air and missile defense capability is right here. So it's great to have you. And then by the fact that Admiral Thomas is here, so we've also got even more expertise. So sir, it's, it, I appreciate you hanging around for our panel as well. All those questions that came up earlier, I'll just defer back to you uh, that relate to integrated air and missile defense. Uh, one other thing too on the panel, I'd be very remiss. Uh, Major General McGillicuddy, who is currently the Chief of Staff of PACAF, has just announced he will fleet up to be the PACAF Vice Commander, working directly for General Carlisle. So, sir, it's great, great news for you. Who? Something about the North Korea launches last week that I want to talk about. Shouldn't come as a surprise. The azimuths of those two missiles were directly headed at Shiriki. That's the radar site. I don't like people shooting at us and neither should you. So the mission of the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Forces that are here in PACOM is vitally important. What I would like to do is show a brief video, kind of encapsulating what, what's uh, gone on for the past year, and then we're gonna get right to the business of all the panel members. And before I go to the video, I do wanna make sure that I get a hat tip to our industry, as well as General Knutson down there. We talk about building partnership capacity. Building partnership capacity. A lot of what we do in phase zero is building the partnerships, as evidenced by General Lee here, but we rely on industry to help build the capacity. And if we are disconnected, then building partnership capacity can go in two very, very diverse directions. So having our industry partners here, having the Missile Defense Agency here is critically important so as we build partnership capacity, both within U.S. forces but as well with our partners, it is is of the most critical importance so we don't have um, different integration, different communications, different types of uh, 
of product builds that are going on within our weapons platforms. So to the uh, General Knutson and the industry folks, thank you also for being part of this panel. So Brian, if I could, if we could uh, cue up the first video. Thank you. North Korea fired two more missiles into the East Sea in the early hours of this Wednesday morning. These two had a much longer range than any of the others. Army Air and Missile Defense, the Army's role in the Pacific. It's Air and Missile Defense Force, specifically in its Patriot uh, and THAAD, um, a capability that is both useful to the peacetime environment and in, in, in the deterrence of war and in the assurance of allies. We stand by our allies, strengthen our own missile defense, and lead the world in taking firm action in response to these threats. Based on a growing and increasingly sophisticated threat, combatant commanders demand for Army air and missile defense is strong and growing. Have deployed a THAAD missile defense system battery to Guam and are in the process of introducing a second TPY-2 ballistic missile defense radar into Japan. These investments will enhance our ability to defend the homeland and Japan. Applause my PAO section to put that together. I get a little verklempt every time I see that video. I'm so proud of it. Okay, so we're going to start out here. Container Box uh, represents a uh, PACOM. He's standing in for General O'Shaughnessy, who had initially accepted to come in, but he's got some operational commitments. But Container does all the BMD work for PACOM. We stayed uh, tied together at the hip. Uh, he's, he's a great representative for, for the BMD missionary, even though he's an Air Force guy, he still, he still understands it. Um, so without further ado, Container, come on up, thanks. Thank you, General Carbler. Uh, at this time, I just want to briefly discuss uh, uh, IMD from a U.S. PACOM combat command perspective. Uh, as many of you know already, PACOM as a combat command is unique in that it must balance regional missile defense along with uh, homeland missile defense. So it's not just the short range, medium range, intermediate range missiles, but also the uh, intercontinental missiles, the ICBMs, if you will. 
ICBMs which can range over 5,500 kilometers and therefore could directly threaten the United States. And additionally, as we look in the future, our job's not going to get any easier. Uh, the, the security environment is becoming more complex and, and more challenging. Air and missile threats among potential adversaries and rogue states in the PACOM area responsibility, AOR if you will, are growing in sophistication. It's just not the quantity of the missiles, but it's also the quality of the missiles that we're facing and their increased capabilities. Secondly, with the proliferation of longer range missiles such as the Road Mobile KN-08, the world is becoming smaller. For example, my boss, Admiral Locklear, uh, states that an unpredictable and nuclear armed North Korea presents the greatest danger to the world, that, which is in his AOR, in the PACOM AOR. And even though the PACOM AOR, as many of you know, stretches from the west coast of the United States to the west coast of India, as Emerald Lockler calls it, from Hollywood to Bollywood, it's just not big enough to uh, outdistance an ICBM. Subsequently, the demand for IAMD systems, such as advanced S-band, advanced X-band radars, Aegis BMD cable ships, Patriot Pack 3 and THAAD batteries will continue to grow. At the same time, our regional allies and partners have an increasing demand and appetite for air and missile defense systems. And just as a reminder, if you didn't know, uh, five uh, out of the seven treaties we have with our allies, <coughs> excuse me, are in the PACOM AOR. So because of the regional demands of missile defense, combined with the uh, Homeland Defense requirements for missile defense and Homeland not just being the 50 states but also our citizens in territories such as Guam. PACOM has taken a greater operational IMD role and to tackle these challenges of missile defense in an A2, AD environment we most focus on three things. Deterrence, joint IMD training and greater partner nation integration. And deterrence, as you may know, can be classified as deterrence by denial, which used in a missile defense construct means active missile defense, such as your air defense batteries combined with your aircraft performing a DCA, defensive counter air role. Or deterrence by punishment, which includes counterforce offensive operations in what our chairman, uh, Chairman Dempsey calls, quote, attacking air missile systems and their supporting command and control structures employing all means, including penetrating assets, to execute the mission, unquote. So to be successful in PACOM, we must be able to do both, de deterrence by denial and deterrence by punishment. Our active missile defense must be employed to deny coercion by rogue states and placed out in the minds of adversaries who seek to intimidate their neighbors through surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Our overall goal is to build an effective layered defense in response to belligerent and destabilizing behaviors. As Chairman Dipsy has stated, IEMD can provide a combatant commander time and space to bring other capabilities to bear and develop and field credible and effective defensive capabilities, which may not only protect our forces during hostilities, but deter an adversary from attempting an air or missile attack. Robust active and passive defenses increase the cost to adversaries by requiring them requiring them to spend more money, spend more on inventory and performance with no comparable increase in their chances of, su of success. For a, a personal testimony, uh, uh, about this time last year, I had a chance to visit Israel, and I was on the is southern Israeli border on, on the Gaza Strip, not too long after the Israeli operation Pillar of Smoke. And I had a chance to visit Iron Dome Battery, and although Iron Dome is not a ballistic missile defense system, it demonstrated that active missile defenses can be effective as they defend infrastructure, they save lives, and they give our forces time and space to maintain, or if necessary, gain the advantage. And in the, in the case of Israel, it gave political decision makers time and space to negotiate versus launching a costly invasion uh, into the Gaza Strip. An example of active missile defense closer to home in PACOM is the recent and by all accounts successful THAAD deployment about this time last year. Some of you in this room were working on that deployment. As an airman, um, I'm familiar with flexible deterrent options, we, we call them FDOs, 
such as you know, deploying fifth generation fighters to a certain part of the world or deploying B-2 or B-52 bombers to a region. And for decades, we've all understood the deterrence value of, of an aircraft carrier deployment to a region and the stability that it can bring. In case of the first ever THAAD battery deployment, we witness a significant historical and effective U.S. Army response. It singularly reinforced PACOM's medium range and intermediate range missile defense and sent a strong measure of resolve to the region. And along those same lines, uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel's recent announcement of the two U.S. Aegis BMD ships to uh, Northeast Asia underscores the deterrent value of IMD. To support the growing this growing network of Army THAAD and, and Aegis BMD ships, we just we can do more. We must do more to create truly joint joint IMD officers. All four services provide outstanding uh, officers. The Air Force has rated aviators. The Navy has its Aegis SWO surface warfare officers. The Army has, of course, Patriot and THAAD, and the Marines have C2 and radar officers as well. Uh, how, however, we at PACOM are, need to create a method to or need a method to create well-rounded joint IMD officers, one who understands all the technologies and defensive systems in order to create and execute a joint layered missile defense especially important as we employ joint engagement zone operations. At the command, command level, we uh, currently create a joint IMD officer about eight to 12 months, depending on their background uh, and their experiences, but we wanna do it faster, and we should do it faster, because the demand for a joint IMD officer is only gonna to continue to grow. At the same time, we must do more with our allies and our partners in regards to IMD. My fellow uh, 06s at the land component, maritime and air component, or they, they will caution me in saying, container, we're doing a lot already, and that's true, we are doing a lot, but we, we, we want to do more. We should, we should train more together at the individual level in classrooms, conduct modeling simulation team building events, and large scale exercises. Our goal is to create a pathway to victory as IMD has become a common language to a common threat. We must develop an integrated defensive network of interoperable IMD systems that leverage cost sharing and help spread the financial investment investment among like-minded nations. We must continue to improve our air picture, make our data links faster, more innovative, such as F-22s linking with THAAD batteries, improve our combat identification at ranges greater from our protected areas, upgrade our discrimination for ballistic missiles, integrate our sensors, and better link our C2 systems. One area we think will help us in this joint and partner nation integration would be a Pacific IEMD Center of Excellence modeled in part on successes of UCOM and CENTCOM, but with a singular focus on, on the Pacific and our challenges here. With our unique resources such as the Pacific Air Operations Center, the Aegis Ashore and Kauai, the Pacific Missile Range Facility, as well as strong and capable missile defense allies, for example, South Korea and Japan, we can maximize our limited resources and provide better trained IMD officers. In summary, as stated by Chairman Dempsey, in order to succeed in IAMD, we must offset fewer resources with more innovation, and we think the specific IMD Center of Excellence is just one step in that necessary innovation to be successful in a joint A2AD IMD environment. Thank you very much. Next up, Major General McGillicuddy, and I'm glad Container mentioned the fact about growing joint officers in IAMD. And it's particularly good news that General McGillicuddy is staying at PACAF. The 94th headquarters later this summer will physically relocate from Fort Shafter to the PACAF headquarters building. So having General McGillicuddy there to help oversee us and make sure we're taken care of as we move into headquarters won't just help us from an infrastructure standpoint, but also help us uh, better develop jointly both between the Army and the Air Force. So future PACAF vice of Major General McGillicuddy. Good morning, and, and aloha. Uh, General Brooks, Admiral Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, I gotta tell you, IAMD should make your head hurt, okay? It's, it's hard. It is, it is not an easy subject, and it's, a, it's an honor to be here speaking at the AUSA uh, on, this, on this topic. Uh, uh, you know, it's, 
it's a timely topic too. And we heard a little bit about it because of the advances in technology with the ballistic missiles and the proliferation of the of the ballistic missiles across the globe. But you know, over the past 25 years, our adversaries and other nations have learned one thing, and that's if you allow the U.S. military to have sanctuary, then we are very, very effective. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why you see the pro proliferation of ballistic missiles out there in the world is to keep uh, uh, U.S. military and other militaries from having sanctuary and then also decreasing our effectiveness. And one of the topics that comes up when you talk about IAMD in this theater is, is China. And when you talk about China, it's difficult because uh, this is not the Cold War. They're not our enemy. We want uh, peace and stability in the region, not just for us, but for all players. But we also want to make sure that no one ever believes a military option will succeed to resolve an issue, uh, especially in this AOR, and that any type of anti-access campaign can be effective. So how do we do this? Uh, we do this through our allies, and it is great to see some of our allies here in this, in this room uh, today. It's, uh, uh, they have significant political, military, and economic capability and capacity that we rely on, and it's probably the one thing that all the commands, the component commands, and PACOM focus on the most in this AOR is theater engagement and security and cooperation efforts. And we do that for a reason. Additionally, we've got to be joint. And the U.S. military does a great job of being joint. And I'm glad you brought that up about moving over to our building because that is just one example. The other example is I rode over here today with, with Pellet and Connolly. Uh, we're, we're buds and us getting together is, is not, this is not the first time we've met each other. So in this AOR, we're pretty strong. But against a high-end adversary, we've got to be joint. It's one of our strengths of our military, so we've got to always keep that in mind. And then finally, when you talk about IAMD, in the past, uh, we thought of IAMD as put a few Patriots over here, put a couple of fighter caps over here, and we're done. And we also did plans where we would just lay down our force and then bring in IAMD on top of it. We can no longer do that. We don't have that luxury. We have to think about IAMD up front and how we're going to integrate uh, and, and, and how we're going to work our alliances and how we're going to do our command and control. And that's got to go in on the front because, quite frankly, the attacker has the advantage. They have the advantage because of the volume, the azimuth, the range, and the time. And most probably, most importantly in, th in this day and age, is their weapons are a lot cheaper than ours, a lot cheaper. So we have to think of IMD as a campaign, if you will, to defeat a campaign. And one component is active defense, and we saw some of that in the videos, but there's also another component that's it's, uh, passive defense. You also have to be able to survive and operate in this type of environment. And you do that through redundancies, camouflage, concealment, deployment, dispersal of assets, not just locally, but also in the theater. Uh, you do that through hardening, but all of that has got to be credible. You've got to train to it. It's got to be affordable. There's got to be doctrine associated with it. There's got to be command and control associated with it. And it's got to be theater wide, no matter what theater you're in. And then on top of all of that, you've got to lay in the command and control structure. And you've got to be able to do command and control across all four services while you're under attack in a denied or contested environment. And the, and the contested environment isn't just inbound missiles and cruise missiles, it's cyber attack, uh, anti-satellite weapons, et cetera. So the challenge for integrated air missile defense, when I started, when I, when I said it's hard and it makes your head hurt, uh, it is. And uh, I'll tell you, it, over, over at PACAF, and I'm sure it's the same as in the other components, it takes up a lot of our time uh, because we've got to get it right. Uh, there, there's just, we've got to get it right, we've got to be efficient, 
and uh, there's not a lot of room for error. I look forward to the questions. Thanks. Next up is uh, Captain Pellet Connolly, our, our great pack fleet rep who uh, brings uh, much needed expertise and knowledge when we come to discussing Aegis BMB, not just U.S. capabilities, but as well as our allied capabilities. So without further ado, Pellet. Thank you, sir. It's good to be here. Just to be clear, I'm an aviator. I'm not an Aegis guy. I speak enough to be dangerous, but once you guys start talking about, uh, you know, math and things like that, then, <laughs> then I step away and, you know, let the, let the surface warriors take over. On October 24th, 2012, Army soldiers from the 94th AAMDC, Navy sailors aboard USS Fitzgerald, and airmen from the 613th AOC here at Hickam conducted the largest, most complex missile defense flight test ever attempted. The result? Simultaneous engagement of five ballistic and cruise missile targets. An integrated air and ballistic missile defense architecture used multiple sensors and missile defense systems to engage several targets at the same time. The Army Terminal High Altitude Air Defense, or THAAD system, successfully intercepted its first medium-range ballistic target in history. Patriot Advanced Cap, er, Pac-3 near simultaneously destroyed a short-range ballistic missile and a low-flying cruise missile over water. For the Navy, USS Fitzgerald successfully engaged a low-flying cruise missile. The Aegis system also tracked and launched an SM-3 Block 1 Alpha interceptor against a short-range ballistic missile. Despite the flawless execution of the ship's crew and spy radar, there was no indication of an intercept of the SRBM. It was later attributed to a problem, an anomaly with the warhead that uh, has been since fixed. The live fire demonstration conducted at Kwajalein Atoll, the Reagan test site here at Hickam Air Force Base and surrounding areas in the West Pacific stressed the performance of the Aegis, THAAD, and Patriot weapon systems while showcasing the intricate and close relationship between services and conducting IAMD. Less than a year later, on September 10, 2013, THAAD weapon system and the Aegis BMD successfully conducted a complex missile defense flight test resulting in the intercept of two medium-range ballistic missile targets in an operationally realistic environment. In the FTO-01 event, a TIPI-2 radar detected the target and relayed track information to the C2BMC system to cue ballistic missile defense assets. This time for the Navy, USS Decatur detected and tracked the missile with its onboard SPY-1 radar. The ship developed a fire control solution, launched an SM-3 Block 1 Alpha, and successfully intercepted the target. In a demonstration of ballistic missile defense layered defense capabilities, a second TIPI-2 radar, located with the THAAD weapon system, acquired and tracked the target missiles. THAAD developed a fire control solution, launched a THAAD missile, and successfully intercepted the second medium-range ballistic target. The event designated FTO, or Flight Test Operational 01, demonstrated integrated, layered, regional missile defense capabilities to defeat a raid of two threat representative medium-range ballistic missiles in a combined live-fire operational test. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen from multiple combatant commands operated the systems and once again were provided a unique opportunity to refine operational doctrine and tactics while increasing confidence in the execution of IAMD. These are but two examples of the integration of U.S. military services in conducting IAMD in the PACOM AOR. And it's vitally important that we continue our cooperative expansion of training and executing air and missile defense. The proliferation and advancing capabilities of potential adversaries in the Far East in missile technology, combined with the slashing of U.S. defense budgets and sequestration, has created a simmering cauldron of uncertainty as the U.S. military and our allies 
grapple with the maniacal unpredictability of North Korea and the rapid, aggressive rise of the People's Republic of China. More than any other mission we do, air and missile defense is pass, fail. You don't get many opportunities to reattack an incoming ballistic missile or counter massive numbers of a cruise missile raid. You got to get it right the first time. And through the cooperation of PACAF, serving as an Air Air Defense Commander, the 94th AAMDC orchestrating the, the Joint Theater Air Missile Defense Process, and the U.S. Navy providing air and ballistic missile defense capabilities, it could be argued that the state of IMD and Pacific is in good hands. Thank you. Thanks, Pellet. I appreciate you bringing up FTO and FTI, the, the tests that we did. There's some detractors out there who say that these tests are highly scripted. Everybody knows what's, what's taking place. But in FTO, the operators did not know what was happening. And at FTO, 15 minutes before target launch, the entire network went down. And CW3 Tim Friend, the JICO, put it, stitched it back together in time to meet the timelines. You don't script an entire network going down 15 minutes before target launch, but yet through the training of our JICO, he was able to bring it back up. So, so that, that test, uh, to me, really validated our operational capability. So speaking about C2, John Barry's next. He's coming from uh, Okinawa, where he uh, commands uh, the uh, TAOC there. And he has a very, very complex job of, of orchestrating and integrating between the, the Japanese, the Marines, US Army, Navy, uh, all the capabilities down there in a, in a very small area of Okinawa. So John Barry, thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as General Carbler mentioned, uh, my name is John Barry, and I am the commanding officer of Marine Air Control Squadron 4, uh, stationed in Okinawa, Japan. I would like to thank General Sullivan and Lieutenant General Swan for inviting me to participate in this momentous symposium. And a very heartfelt thank you to General Carbler. The 94th AAMDC has been a terrific host of my stay here in this uh, beautiful state. Lieutenant General Swan's question for me was, hey John, how do we conduct integrated air and missile defense in the littoral and other operating environments as part of a joint or coalition team to leverage land force capabilities and improve responsiveness to threats throughout the Asia Pacific. Uh, the fact that I'm attending an Army symposium notwithstanding, uh, I'm glad I'm sitting next to Captain Connolly uh, because that is where my story starts, from the sea. In this theater, it's gonna be 7th Fleet, along with ROC Navy or Japanese Maritime Self Defenders that will have to partner to be that first set of eyes, ears, and teeth protecting the combined forcible entry operatives from both air breathing or missile threats. The Coalition Joint Force Air Component Commander, working hand in hand with the Coalition Joint Force Maritime Component Commander, will need to ensure that that Joint Force Commander wisely disperses Aegis, E3, E2, and shooter coverage as the world's most complicated military maneuver is executed that combined forcible entry operation amphibious landing against a thinking foe with his own free will. There is no better illustration of the importance of our continued strong relationship as a Navy Marine Corps team and our need to include and practice with our coalition stakeholders cannot be overstated. Later, as the landing forces environment begins to mature, and the force protection posture is deemed appropriate, the ANTPS-59 radar, with its range, multi tattle architecture, and air-breathing threat, tactical ballistic missile detection capability, may then be deployed and employed by its Marines. Normally, this asset provides the combined joint force commander the assurance needed to safely deactivate the amphibious operations area and establish the MAGTAF commander's landward battle space because the TPS-59 releases that MAGTAF commander's reliance upon the JIFMIC or JFAC for surveillance. 
The Joint Force Commander is now free to shift AWACS, Aegis, Hawkeye, etc. elsewhere throughout the area of operations. Additionally, the MAGTAF com Commander now becomes a contributor to the CJFAC's overall link architecture, vice simply being a customer. He now is able to feed all the Joint Force Commander's components with critical real-time or near real-time situational awareness. In other operational environments, such as Okinawa, the soldiers of the 1st of the 1st Air Defense Artillery Battalion are very close friends of ours, as are the airmen of the 623rd Air Control Flight. Not only do we invite each other to each other's birthday balls, promotion ceremonies, and St. Barbara's Day celebrations, but as General Carbler just witnessed a few weeks ago, our exercises are inextricably linked. General Carbler and I walked through a facility on Kadena Air Base just the other day that housed the Sector Air Defense Commander's Post. It was manned by airmen, soldiers, and Marines managing the air defense picture and directing fire missions with Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force and 7th Fleet assets, all benefiting from the integrated data being coalesced and distributed via a rack of digital switches provided by the Missile Defense Agency. For anyone who has lived in Okinawa as long as I have, which will be six years come July, it is hard to ignore the fact that the threat is extremely close to my family and to the families of our fellow island mates, both U.S. and Japanese. A defense of Okinawa scenario highlights the strengths and the weaknesses of a coalition slash joint kill chain like none other. The strengths include the interlocking sensor coverage of Aegis, AWACS, and TPS-59, and Patriot assets, complemented by our host nation's organic radar network. The weaknesses still hinge on our ability to share data across coalition networks, complicated by numerous language barriers. Many of these weaknesses could simply be molehills once people start shooting at us, but they seem like mountains when trying to prove operational concepts during normal red tape laden exercises. In a recent meeting, General Carbler put me on the spot in front of a joint and coalition audience as we discuss the results of Keen Edge and IAMD War Game 5 with our Japanese partners. If I remember correctly, he asked, hey, John Barry, do you think you could command this fight? Referring to the JMSDF, 7th Fleet, 18th Wing, 1st of the 1st ADA Battalion, 613th AOC, TAOC laydown that was simulated in the, in, the, in the exercise. My response, yes, sir. If you delegate me the correct authorities, and given that I can talk across these joint and coalition networks. As a maneuverist by trade, my default position is always mission type orders, centralized command and decentralized control. My upbringing is to train that NCO or lieutenant to the point where he or she can regurgitate my intent so that I know if he or she is handed the flag as the highest ranking member remaining in my unit, that they'll know and carry out the mission to my end state. This takes the moral courage as a leader to empower and then to trust. After the violence starts, I may not be able to talk with my commanders, and they won't have time to look over their shoulder for direction from me. That's really what it all comes down to. It doesn't matter the color or pattern of your uniform, or whether you're a rock marine, rock af airman, or Japanese ground, air, or maritime self-defender. When people start shooting at you, it only matters how quickly and efficiently you can kill the enemy in order to defend that brave volunteer or conscript sitting next to you. In order for the next generation to be better than us and the joint coalition kill chain to be shorter tomorrow than it is today, the next generation shouldn't have to be worried about the unity of command. It should be second nature, even in a joint slash interagency coalition. They shouldn't have to worry about whether or not they can share data with a coalition partner. Exercise or not, if they can't train how they fight, then we're wasting their time. And lastly, the next generation of sector, regional, and area air defense commanders should have this question ensconced in their own OODA loops. What authorities am I delegated? And do they enable me to kill the enemy faster than he can kill us? Or Clausewitz would have us all fired. We owe the next generation at least that much because they are our sons and daughters because they are growing up in a shrinking world, 
and because we love them. Thank you. Thanks, John. I did put John on the spot because I could give John Barry a TA-312 and he could go ahead and command and control. He's that exceptional of a leader. So we've heard from the operator side. Now we're going to switch over to the acquisition side and we're honored to have Major General Ole Knutson here from the Missile Defense Agency. Thanks, sir. General Sullivan and AUSA, thanks for the opportunity to speak here and talk about what MDA is doing in synchronization with PACOM and other combatant commands to provide capability for IMD. Um, I was going to show a video on THAAD, but Dan kind of uh, did that. And then I was going to talk about FTI-01, which is in October 12, and integrated testing, but Captain Connolly did that. But I'll still do a little bit of that. But thanks for, we weren't well coordinated here. If, if what we're doing at MDA, as all of you I'm sure know, is trying to respond to this growing threat of missiles, b ballistic missiles and um, cruise missiles. We're, we're a little bit involved in that as the integrated test is showing um, to make sure that things are doing. And, and as we're doing that, we're obviously challenged by resources as, as everybody is, but we're, we're trying to prioritize and synchronize everything to provide the capacity and the capabilities that both the regional and homeland defense, and I'll talk about a couple of the systems that we're working on. That I'll show a video on here, and then I'll talk a little bit about it, and then I'll talk about the ground-based mid-course defense system, which protects Hawaii and the continental United States and Alaska, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing on sensors in the Pacific. So go ahead and show the video, please. And what you'll see in this video is a little bit of the THAAD system. I don't know how much the, everyone in the audience knows about THAAD, the components of it. Obviously, it has a launcher and a radar and a command and control system. And you'll see in the video the first test that we did for the operational test, FTT-12. And in this test, there will be an engagement of two simultaneous targets to simulate a raid. And this is the test that enabled us to go ahead and be able to field this capability. It's a deployable system. Obviously, it's not a small system. That's the air launch target that that you'll see engage. And that's a what we call a FMA target launched off a C platform. There's that interceptors launching to engage those targets. Both of those were intercepts. It's a hit to kill. And then this is a, a little video of the FTI-01 that Captain Connolly talked about this is the THAAD participation in that. And again, there were five simultaneous targets in the air in that test, three ballistic missile and two air targets. THAAD intercepted its target, Patriot intercepted its target, Aegis intercepted its target, and the one that he talked about, we had an anomaly with one Aegis missile and we've corrected that. Uh, so next chart, please. So a little bit on THAAD. And I know that everybody in the audience probably knows that we deployed a battery to Guam, a battery minus anyway, about this time last year, came operational in April. And we have another battery that's at Fort Bliss. We have a third battery that will complete the training later this year in October. A fourth battery that was just activated earlier, um, about two weeks ago. So, we're, and then we're on the capacity to get to seven batteries. So six of them are on track to be there by the end of 2017 to be in the mix for deployments wherever they are. I won't talk about whether they're gonna be deployed in Hawaii or Korea. I know there's a discussion going on about that. And then there's a seventh bad battery that we got into the budget. It's really funded in 16 and 17 that would be available in the 2020 timeframe. We're working with the Army staff to figure out if there is a, if it's reasonable or practical to pull that forward and be able to uh, start fielding that in 2016, we think we have a way to do that, and and that would and get the the seventh battery there a couple years earlier. That makes a lot of sense from a lot of perspectives. So we're working that in synchronization with the Army staff. Um, that is very successful in its testing program. It's 11 for 11. Uh, we are doing more stressing testing in the future. We'll do an IRBM test 
in FY15 to um, actually demonstrate or uh, simulate the mission that it, the unit on Guam has. We've, we certainly think we have the capability, but we haven't actually done that intercept testing and that will happen. We got that into the budget and working that, and then we'll do another IRBM test later. And, and as was described earlier, that is participating in these integrated tests. There'll be another integrated test in what we call the FTO 02 in FY15, where Thad and Aegis will both participate again. There's a lot that's been learned out of this integrated testing, and it's as General Carbler said, it's not entirely scripted. There's a lot of lessons learned that have been come out of this from both, I'll call it from a con ops and, and TTPs, as well as some changes and improvements to the systems that we are implementing as we've learned from those tests. We'll have the institutional training base established by the end of FY15 at Fort Sill. That's a, obviously an, a major step in the maturity of the THAAD system because it puts on a sustainable future path for the future and not just doing new equipment training with units. It's, it's a sustainment training base for all soldiers going forward then. Uh, we've worked with, uh, with the TICA mod at Fort Sill to redesign what we call the missile round pallet to be able to deploy really a pallet that has eight interceptors loaded up ready to go on a, on a C-17 as opposed to shipping them one at a time which will save significantly in how much it takes to deploy and the time to uh, be ready to go on the ground on the other end. I know that's a, a thing that PACOM certainly, General Carbler let us know and others and so we responded to that. And then we're also assessing what we call THAAD extended range or THAAD ER. Quite frankly, we're challenged by the budget on this, but THAAD ER is a concept that's much like the, what's called the missile segment enhancement for Patriot. And it gives an extra boost to the booster. The MSE for, is the improvement for PAC-3 that the Army has now just gotten permission to go into production on. And this would be a similar type concept it would significantly improve the THAAD footprint as far as defended area and its capability against raids and I'll say its capability against some other emerging targets. So we're looking at that hard um, on how we could get that going. Next chart, please. And I'll also say on THAAD before, um, industry is gonna talk a little bit about FMS Act opportunities, but there are FMS opportunities and to build partner capacity in this region. And I won't go into that right now because they will. On the ground-based mid-course defense GMD, so it's providing protection against attacks from ICBM attacks from North Korea and Iran. That's what our, and it's 365, 24-7, and it protects Hawaii, protects Alaska, and it protects CONUS. Uh, our next test is in a couple of months. We've had some <coughs> problems with tests. Some of you have probably read about those. And we believe that we've corrected that and that we'll demonstrate that in the test that's coming up. But we also acknowledge that this system was really rushed to the, put in the, in the capability in the early 2000s to meet a limited capability and some of the engineering was shortcut. And so we've uh, programmed into the, the future over the next few years to completely redesign the EKV to improve, through it, improve its reliability and its producibility and really it's testability on the ground to ensure that we have a, a greater confidence as we go into these uh, really strategically important tests that everything's gonna work. And then we're also improving across our whole BMDS architecture, uh, the discrimination capabilities to respond to the threats. That's in sensors and in the GMD system. Next chart. Just a little bit on sensors in the Pacific, and this was mentioned earlier. So there is a deployment of a second TIPI Y2 in the forward base mode that will happen in Japan by the end of this year. Uh, we're just awarding the military construction contract on that this week, as a matter of fact. And then there will be a lot of activity to go on to get that in place. That will be the second one. It provides both regional and homeland defense capabilities to augment what's already there. We have the continued sea-based X-band radar support that's been activated several times over the last year to deal with real world and test scenarios. And we see that continuing. Clear is a, uh, an additional site that we're upgrading in Alaska.
to have another early warning system capability that will be available by the end of 2016. And then in our long range plans now uh, for the budget in 15 through 19, we've got in the development of what we call the long range discriminating radar with a targeted deployment time of 2020. And that will significantly improve our ability to uh, discriminate targets that are coming in against the Homeland Defense Mission and augment what is there for SBX. It'll give us a 365 capability to do that. And then we're also exploring the increased use of space sensors and then UAS systems for both IR and LADAR detection and ranging capabilities for the future. And with that, I'll take questions later. Thank you. You know, Admiral Searing's committed to the warfighter, too. He was just out here last month uh, with the PACOM leadership, PACAF, all the component leadership. Took, uh, you know, he's a busy man, but he took a day out of his schedule to brief us on all the updates that MDA was having. And frankly, that he wanted to hear from the warfighters and what capabilities and responsiveness that we see out of MDA is, uh, is heartfelt. So, General Knudsen, sir, thanks. Please take our thanks back to Admiral Searing as well. So, next up is Gene Stuckel from Lockheed Martin. Gene's been with the air defense community for a long time and uh, is going to talk a little bit on FMS. Gene. Good morning, uh, Gene Stockholm. On, on behalf of Lockheed Martin, I want to say I'm honored to be here and participate in the panel. I wanted to give you a perspective on foreign military sales, the importance of foreign military sales and how it would deliver partner capacity, and also how the foreign military sales environment is evolving uh, in an era of cons constrained budgets. First chart, please. The foreign military sales as a tool for building partner capacity is a vital component of our U.S. foreign policy. As outlined in this chart, it provides several important benefits. It defrays costs, shares burden, reduces reliance on U.S. forces for protection. It stretches across the economic domains of, of which are increasingly important in an environment characterized by geopolitical tensions, economic uncertainty, and constrained defense budgets. The Department of Defense and industry are making great strides to promote greater cooperative development and co-production as increasingly important cost containment and partner capacity initiatives. The policy framework is in place and efforts are moving a pace to reform our policies on technology release and protections to ensure that we can collaboratively share in the development of our next generation capability. It's rapidly coming an organizing principle in our efforts to attract foreign investment to enable development of the future capability that we need. We see the outlines of the policy described in the, the Ballistic Missile Defense Report, the Joint Integrated Air and Missile Defense Vision 2020, and the QDR, all of which recognize and promote the importance of multilateral agreements and partner investment. When it comes to air and missile defense, the government and industry, U.S. government and industry, have a proven track record of supporting our friends and allies across the world with proven capabilities. Case in point is in, since 2005, the government and industry has worked arm in arm with our allied countries in SANTCOM's area of responsibility to increase partner capacity in IAMD with successful air and missile defense FMS programs underway with Kuwait, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Oman. These programs, including PAC-3 and THAAD, and command and control upgrades to air and missile defense operations centers, are promoting greater cooperation and expanded interoperability across the region, resulting in reduced reliance on U.S. forces. Efforts are underway to more fully implement this mo the same model for increasing partner capacity in other vital corners of the globe, none more so than here in the, in the Pacific. Today, we have mature and growing government industrial, par industrial partnerships and in integrated air and missile defense with countries across the region. The question as we look to the future is how do we extend these relationships 
and leverage our partnerships to provide the modernized capabilities we need against growing threats in the Pacific and elsewhere. Patriot, upgraded with the Pac-3 hit-to-kill interceptor, remains a cornerstone of U.S. and coalition land-based air and missile defense across the globe. The introduction of the Pac-3 missile segment enhancement, which will increase the battle space and increase the agility of the interceptor throughout its, its operational mission profile, uh, will provide significant enhanced capability against emerging air missile defense threats. This will start initiated in production this year, and we hope to have the first uh, initial operation capability within the next 18 to 24 months as those interceptors start rolling off the line. The THAAD system is the latest fielded addition to a layered architecture for regional and homeland air missile defense capability, unique in its ability to engage ballistic missiles both inside and outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Closing gaps with our lower tier systems. We see increasing growth and interest among our international partners in the unique capability that THAAD brings to the battlefield. U.S. and coalition Aegis BMD equipped ships provide the vital complement to land-based AMD systems and contribute mobility, responsiveness to our collective air and missile defenses by preserving freedom of maneuver and access to critical regions across the Pacific and elsewhere in the global commons. Unfortunately, uh, there are not enough of these critical capabilities in U.S. allied inventories uh, to address the growing air and missile defense threats in an increasingly unstable international environment. That our AMD forces need to be modernized and transformed is not in question. Next chart, please. The question becomes, how are we going to get there? These uh, represent attributes of the future force that we are trying to acquire. And in era constrained budgets, the strategy is how do we do it? How do we get these capabilities to our troops and allies? How do we defray the cost of development, testing, and procurement of these capabilities? These systems are extraordinarily expensive and it takes a lot of time to develop. In the past, the U.S. by and large has shouldered responsibility for the development of these capabilities and marketed the systems to our friends and allies through foreign military sales. The, however, the the FMS landscape is changing. There's increasing awareness that the U.S. can no longer assume its qualitative technological advantage will remain a discriminator as our partners and allies seek to upgrade their own systems. They seek a cooperative development environment with the U.S. Uh, that would be, that redounds to the benefit of both our allies and us in defraying the cost of development and fueling of these systems. Countries across the globe, both friend and adversary, are obtaining technological advances in military capability, closing the gaps with U.S. The model in which we develop the system and sell via the FMS paradigm is evolved. There will be more cooperative development, I believe, in the future. Our friends and allies want more equity in the development to mature their defense industrial bases and promote an economic growth. They seek deeper relationship with the United States in the development and, and, um, of these systems as they seek to expend their own resources to uh, assume and develop their indigenous capabilities against these threats. Offset programs under the FMS contribute, but by themselves may not be enough to attract the foreign investment required to seal the deal on future programs. We see this emerging among our allies in Europe as countries such as Poland, Turkey, Germany, and Italy seek to upgrade their air missile defense systems. We can expect that other partners and allies in the Asia Pacific region to follow suit and seek a greater role in the development of air missile defense capability. This is good politics and good business in terms of the uh, defraying the cost of these system development. Future successful programs will, by design, and international, uh, need international partnerships to defray the development costs, strengthen international relations, and achieve economies of scale and production, and promote training and joint and coalition interoperability. We want the and need this participation and investment. The benefit and benefits are great. The costs without it are becoming prohibitive, given where are we are in our budgets and the challenges that we face as we go forward. 
The U.S. development efforts with Germany and Italy this year, while coming to a close, you know, have developed a state-of-the-art lightweight 360-degree AESA surveillance and fire control radars, possessing the attributes we need and the capabilities we desire. Uh, they have advanced plug-and-flight integrated fire control, enabling the defeat of TBM and cruise missiles, aircraft, and U.S. threats approaching from any direction. These are the building blocks of our future IAMD enterprise network and provide options for the U.S. as we go forward and look at what our future capabilities may, be, may, may need and desire and the timelines associated with the development of these. We anticipate these development efforts to continue as our allies Germany and Italy pursue follow-on efforts and Poland initiates programs to update their own and update and field their own modernized systems. As the Army IAMD program matures, these capabilities provide the U.S. with options. The development and fielding of these cooperatively developed capabilities will ensure the U.S. maintains its industrial leadership in the development and fielding of these important and vital capabilities. In closing, it is increasingly clear that FMS of U.S. produced capabilities as a tool for building partner capacity is changing. Cooperative development and co-production of IAMD systems and architecture represents a path forward to obtaining capabilities we will need to confront the threats we face today. These programs require patience and commitment as we work to promote the common defense and develop the next generation capabilities we, we need in an era of fiscal constraint. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gina. Next, Mr. Chapel will come and talk to us from Boeing about uh, C2. General Brooks, General Sullivan, thank you for, for having me here. Uh, my division of, at Boeing is responsible for ICBM sustainment, integrated air and missile defense, and directed energy weapons and sensors. So I'm honored to participate on this panel. I've been asked to talk today about interoperability. So in my brief comments, I'd like to leave you with three points. Oh, next chart, please. Uh, interoperability is about trust, capabilities, and partnering. Partnering not only with joint and foreign militaries, but also with industry. Over the past couple days, we've heard a lot about building trust. General Dubik said, we don't know when the next deployment will be, so it's relationships and trust that matter most. General Thompson talked about the importance of the internationalization of the PACOM staff. And General Carbler has said, you can't surge trust. All of which resonate to me as a retired foreign area officer and which our military has learned in spades over the last decade of coalition operations. When you think about interoperability in IAMD, the tendency is to focus on just the tactical integration of sensors, shooters, and mission command. But IMD interoperability is also about the technical integration of systems, about integrating the hardware and software of existing national weapon systems to achieve the results that our land forces require. As developers and manufacturers, we build trust by delivering quality products that work. For Boeing, that means that every Pac-3 seeker we ship off to Lockheed, every SM-3 kinetic warhead we ship to Raytheon, Every aero interceptor we ship over to Israel and every GBI that we deploy at Fort Greeley and Vandenberg goes into a system that will be deployed to defend U.S., allied, and partner soldiers and populations. That resonates with us. When it rolls off the assembly line, it had better work. You trust us to do that, and we trust our suppliers, both domestic and global, to deliver quality parts and components so we can deliver reliable capabilities and systems that will achieve their deterrent and defensive missions. Since a large chunk of our defense industry workforce has come from the military, many of us send our sons and daughters, nephews and nieces off to the military. So we have a very personal vested interest in making sure that we give you the best products that we can. The second point is capability. General Matthews told us yesterday that we'll never have enough interceptors, so as coalition partners, we need to combine our efforts. 
Admiral Searing, the director of MDA, recently testified that building partner BMD capability and supporting the strategic shift to Asia Pacific are major international goals. So how can industry help U.S. allied and partner nations link their systems together to achieve the maximum IMD capability? We can provide you with open architecture systems to move towards the ultimate goal of plug and play, any sensor, any shooter systems. Industry can help you integrate those legacy systems into the regional IAMD architecture so that you can more efficiently bring all these existing systems into the IAMD fight and minimize the waste of interceptors, which are few and costly. In the Indo-Asia Pacific theater, there are a variety of IAMD systems, sensors, shooters, mission command, some of them U.S. manufacture, some indigenous, and some purchased from third parties. It's not always easy to get U.S. systems to work together, but industry can help you figure that out. A good example of where we're able to move beyond the stovepipe systems and tie everything together for a, a maximum capability was a second shooter demonstration we did last year with Army Space and Missile Defense Command. We linked Avenger and Patriot systems together into the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Battle Command System, or IBCS. So now we need to work together to bring in additional, par additional partner assets, irrespective of where they were produced, to the IMD network architecture to meet our common defense. My last point is about partnering. We've talked about the importance of partnering with other services and nations in the Pacific region and building relationships of trust. But I also urge you to partner with industry. You know, as the defense budget has shrunk, uh, competitions have gotten more fierce, uh, procurement protests have increased, uh, and there seems to be uh, increasing reticence to have frank, open conversations with industry. Each of us industry partners spends millions of dollars on research and development on new products to help you defeat our enemies. We don't want to waste those precious R&D dollars on things you don't want. So tell us, your goals, your objectives, your aspirations. Let us get our prototypes into the hands of, of your soldiers. That will help us focus our efforts. One of the areas we've been investing in is the development of directed energy weapons to break the cost curve on IMD intercepts and to counter UAVs, rockets, artillery mortars, and cruise missiles. We're partnered with many of the contractors you see here at this conference to bring these weapons and sensors to our land forces. But we are not the only ones investing. There's lots of foreign investment around the world, including with some of our potential adversaries. It may, it may be blasphemy, but U.S. industry hasn't cornered the market on good ideas. Each of us has partner companies around the world and many of the countries represented here that are co-producing, co-developing, supplying parts and components for military and commercial systems and are doing cutting-edge research on advanced technologies to help us win this fight. We would be happy to leverage our industrial capabilities and relationships. And as to the, poli the policy issues that General Sullivan mentioned yesterday, that also includes our political relationships. So invite us in and tell us how we can help you. Not only does industry have tremendous capabilities ranging from labs to test integration and production facilities, to world-class engineers and scary smart rocket scientists. We also uh, employ ex-military guys like me who can help bridge the gap. So in short, in closing, partner with us. We want to help you find land forces solutions. You don't need to speak rocket science to talk to us. We all speak grunt. So thanks for your time. I'm honored to be part of this panel, and I look forward to questions. We have some written uh, questions. I don't know if uh, from the audience, though, if there's anybody that uh, wants to man a microphone and ask a question based on the uh, topics that came up since you uh, wrote some down. But if not, I think uh, maybe we'll just start down at that end. General Knudsen, I think you have one, and we'll just work our way down. Okay, I'll read it. Uh, does the missile defense community believe that the maneuvering and hypersonic incoming enemy missiles are a near-term Chinese threat, and will current systems defeat that threat? Um, uh, I'll avoid getting too deep into this, but I'll say um, we certainly are aware of what appears to be capability from potential threats. 
and are assessing our ability to defeat that. We do think that there are things that could be implemented in the relatively near term. It, it's a resource constraint that we're dealing with. It's really not even, I'll call it new technology. And I actually referenced some of that when I talked about some stuff in relation to THAAD. But I won't get into much more detail on that. It's, it's more of a research, resource constraint at this point than, than anything else. And so as this emerges, we're prioritizing to, to deal with that. My question is, how does the tyranny of distance within the Pacific Impact IMD Mission Command, with a follow-on question, what are some material and non-material solutions that it can improve IMD Mission Command? So I, when we say tyranny of distance, uh, one of the answers is paucity of satellites is one thing you'll see in this, in this region of the world. But it makes moving assets more difficult. Uh, you, you got to work on country clearances. The timelines are going to be a little bit longer. You have less face-to-face -face, uh, briefings, debriefings, interactions uh, with, with those that you work with and your logistics and supply uh, are, are all more difficult. As far as uh, what are some material and non-material solutions that can improve IMD Mission Command, uh, non-material would be authorities, have those done, spelled out, understood, have mission type orders ready to go. Uh, you work on this through exercises, engagements, uh, relationships, and I can't read that last word, okay. And then the, uh, the non-material would be layered networks, redundant networks, and then you need protected and uh, hardened comms would be really nice too. Thank you. And we do practice distributed control. I mean, we, uh, in different exercises, we, we go through and degrade comms. Um, so that we aren't uh, subject to the tyranny of distance. And we push commander's intent, you know, mission style orders down to um, deputy AADC authorities in, in either the Republic of Korea or the deputy AADC who would be with Fifth Air Force in Japan. And, and we, we rehearse that uh, um, pretty frequently. Okay. Um, pacom has got a couple of questions here. And they, they do relate to each other, so I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, uh, you mentioned establishing a Pacific IMD Center of Excellence, what is the intended scope of the center and in what ways will this improve joint and combined IMD? Uh, fortunately, I have two general officers who, who are familiar with the CENTCOM uh, Center of Excellence and saw firsthand how it builds r relationships uh, with, with each other as a component level and with, with the partner nations. Uh, the charter will, will, will be very much uh, component driven, what the components want to get out of it. The unique capability we have on Hawaii is our components are all on one place geographically, so we, we, can, we can leverage that. Uh, but synchronization, predicta predictability when it comes to IAMD training, uh, be able to uh, come in at the company grade, field grade officer level uh, to train, uh, to go through academics together, PACOM specific, do some mid-level modeling simulation, uh, do learning our, learning our blocking and tackling, our fundamentals when it comes to IMD, and um, and then uh, do large-scale exercises where you get signed off. As an airman, we, we do check rides, form eights. I know the Patriot batteries do the same thing with your crew certifications, your individual certifications, and your crew certifications. But, but that's what we're, that's at least in my mind, was, was what I, I envisioned it as. Uh, and then uh, the partner nations, once we get our act together, the partner nations are invited to come, pay to play. So you have a Japanese officer talking about the Japanese system. You have a South Korean officer talking about their systems, and we, we're talking about our systems and you're building those relationships. And, and also, um, learning the different systems of so C2, BMC, and Geeks are kind of your weapon systems, if you will. Uh, being able to, to learn those and employ those and, and getting, getting trained in them. Uh, a lot of you know that you go into exercises and it's, it's a just go fight and then you get evaluated and there was not a whole lot of chances to train and, and to try different things uh, at, a, at a lower level. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm looking at as well. In my, in my, so syn synchronize our efforts and a unity of effort. And that kind of plays into the second question that says, please describe the interaction between PACOM's theater missile defense structure and NORAD, NORTHCOM, uh, uh, GMD structure to defend the North American homeland. 
Uh, you may have heard Admiral Locklear talk at, about oper operationalizing the PACOM headquarters. And I think this is just one example of it. Uh, at the PACOM headquarters at the combat command, you think of that as being the strategy, the uh, ethereal uh, people up in the clouds at Camp Smith who are thinking about policy and strategy, but it's much more of that. It's, it's, it's very operational. I, there's people in my division who are manning the common operating picture for the Link 16, so the BMD architecture, the CTP, the tactical pictures, and we'll also have people on scope, C2 BMC and the Geek system, who, who are interacting with, with uh, NORTHCOM and with the AADC, the theater AADC, uh, on a real-time given situation, so it's very much operationally uh, focused, and we, um, and, and we interact quite a bit with NORTHCOM, uh, mainly the sensors out there. You can't have a sensor or a, a weapon system that just does one thing for one commander. You, you gotta share it. And how you share it, is, is that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. And that's what we work towards being effective for, for uh, in this case, both combatant commanders. So hopefully that answers the question. And we run exercises with uh, NORTHCOM uh, many times during the month from uh, the sensor managers at the 94th all the way up through PACOM. Um, I got a THAAD question here. Has the recent THAAD deployment to Guam validated the expeditionary capacity and required support capability? Um, that's a great question. THAAD kind of had a, uh, hey, it takes weeks. You got to clear out football fields worth of real estate, uh, lay concrete pads, and that's just not the case. THAAD deployed and got operational within 48 hours, and frankly, we were just waiting on the missiles to show up. It's been operational now for a year. As a matter of fact, just last week, <coughs> We just ripped TOA, so Alpha 4 went home back to Fort Bliss and Alpha 2 replaced those soldiers, um, quiet professionals that they are. For 10 months out of the past 12 months, THAAD has been at a very high alert state. And I'm going to jinx myself here, but with about a .99 operational readiness rate. Of course, as soon as I say that, somebody's going to call the AOC and say THAAD just went down. But, um, and it's been very austere. It has been out on a northwest field and at the Anderson Air Base, if you know where that is. Uh, no overhead, no motor pools, no bays, no lifts. Just a great piece of equipment that's being maintained daily by great soldiers. The 36th Wing has, has been great joint partners with us and providing us with facilities as needed. But I will tell you, all the costing that goes into operating THAAD for a year, we probably have a better answer than what the, what the trim models or schoolhouses or anybody else might come up with. Um, it's been a lot of work, but again, I, my hat's off to industry um, and the Missile Defense Agency for giving us a capability that frankly uh, works very, very well uh, in full operational mode. Um, we are improving the site out there in Guam. You know, we're we're going to get a, a tent, a maintenance tent, and some other things out there for the soldiers. I know it's not high tech, you know, multi $300 million system. We're going to get a tent out there to get it, but I think that's the least we can do for them. But as far as the deployment timelines and then just the operational capability and the requirements for it, um, we're, we're going back to the schoolhouse and, and letting them know just exactly what it takes.